Now, let me introduce you to Alem Zekaria as alumna alpha. Alem is a pharmacist by training with a master in drug discovery and development from Uppsala University. She is currently working as a pharmacovigilance scientist within the research section at the Uppsala Monitoring Center, and she has been doing that for five years. She is the responsible person for medication errors at the organization. Before that, she has been working as a team manager at the pharmacovigilance support department at Uppsala Monitoring Center as a pharmacy manager for two years at two community pharmacies and with clinical trials. Dr. Lumna Alp is a pharmacist, a specialist in epidemiology in public health. She has an experience of 18 years at the Centre Antipoisson et de Pharmacovigilance du Maroc. She is closely involved in the whole process of pharmacovigilance activities. Since 2006, she is focusing on medication errors management and patient safety from medication error database construction to implementing risk minimization actions. She contributed to the WHO guideline reporting and learning systems for medication errors, the role of pharmacovigilance centers. Dr. Luna participates in education and training regarding medication errors at both national and international levels. Alem and Dr. Lubna will present their conference entitled The Importance to Report Medication Errors. We invite you to actively participate during his presentation. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat on the left. We will be responding to as many as we can during the allotted time. The rest of the questions will be answered and published in our Q&A section within Patient Safety Day on our webpage isoponline.org. Without further preamble, please give a warm welcome to Alem and Dr. Lubna. Thank you so much for that introduction. This is the outline for the webinar, and I will start with a short introduction overview of Uppsala Monitoring Center, or UMC, as it also is referred as, with a special focus on the research department, which is the department I work in, followed by slowly introducing you to the topic medication arrows from a global perspective. Then I will talk a bit about the two medication error related projects performed at UMC the last couple of years, the latest one with colleagues from the Mar Moroccan National Pharmacovigilance Center. Dr. Lubna will then take over and present how the Moroccan Pharmacovigilance Center actually works practically with medication errors on a national level, from reporting to communication and risk minimization. So, Uppsala Monitoring Center, who are we? Everything started in the 1960s when children in many countries were born with serious malformation as a result of their mothers having taken the drug thalidomide to treat cancer while being pregnant. At this time, there were no global system in place to collect information about adverse drug reactions. To prevent future tragedies of this kind, the World Health Organization set up a pilot project in Geneva together with a small group of patients in 1968. This was later made permanent as the WHO program for international drug monitoring and operational activities were moved to the foundation WHO Collaborating Center for International Drug Monitoring set up in Uppsala in 1978 under the sponsorship of the Swedish government. It was not until mid 90s that the field name Uppsala Monitoring Center were adopted. So, in the beginning, there were these 10 countries involved. Today, the WHO program consists of 140 member countries, which covers around 95% of the world's population. The aim with the WHO program is to ensure that early signs of previously unknown medicine-related safety problems are identified and information about them shared and acted upon. Uppsala Monitoring Center, which is located in Uppsala, Sweden, is an independent, non-profit, self-funded organization. We provide scientific leadership and operational support to the WHO Program for International Drug Monitoring. We are also the custodian and manager of VigiBase, which I will come back to later, which is basically the WHO database for individual case safety reports. And the maintenance organization 
for the WHO drug terminology. The organization consists of different departments and beyond research, we have, for example, a pharmacovigilance support department and a communication department. UMC's vision is a world where all patients and healthcare professionals make wise therapeutic decisions in their use of medicines. This is being achieved or tried to be achieved by our mission, which is to support and promote patient safety through building sustainable and effective pharmacovigilance practices globally. There are several of WHO collaborative center or WHO CCs for pharmacovigilance in addition to UMC. The Moroccan center is responsible for strengthening PV practices by providing training for Francophone, Eastern Mediterranean and Arabic countries. They are also the center of excellence in medication errors. The Netherlands Centre is responsible for patient reporting and for developing a university PV curriculum. The Norway Centre is responsible for drug statistics methodology. And the new US WHOCC is the Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission, in charge of PVPI, responsible for pharmacovigilance in public health programs and regulatory services. Vigibase is the heart of the WHO program and a valuable reference source. Up until now, the database contains of more than 21 million suspected adverse drug reaction reports, removing suspected duplicates, which is the largest database available. Reports are being submitted from different sources, including clinical trials, patients, health professionals, and pharma companies to the national center in a country, which in turn share the reports with the database. Signal detection is one of UMC's main tasks, and the overall aim is to identify previously unknown adverse drug reactions and other drug-related problems, including drug interactions and medication errors, as soon as possible. UMC screen VigiBase on a regular basis to identify drug ADR pairs that should undergo manual assessment. But before the manual assessment step, we decide on a clinical focus area, Apply, on certain, apply certain inclusion and exclusion criteria, as well as an algorithm called VigiRank, which can help us in the prioritization of a drug event pair by taking in different aspects into account, such as captured information on the suspected report, the report year, and the geographical spread of the report, for example. If you would like to know more about VigiRank, there is an article published, which I have referred to on this slide. If we then decide, after having conducted an expanded clinical evaluation, that the combination is a signal, it's communicated in a search and statistical tool named Vigilize, which is developed by UMC. Vigilize is accessible to the WHO member countries. At this stage, the signal is restricted to only the national centers. With a few months delay, the signals are also published in the WHO pharmaceutical newsletter, which is available to the public free of charge. The reason for the delay is that these signals are in a very, very early stage and the national centers should have some time to consider these before reaching the public. It is important here to mention that UMC is not a regulatory body. We do not and we cannot decide what each country should or should not do. We can prov provide what we have seen in the database, but then it is up to each country to make their own decision based on their sales. The research department also conduct methodological research that sometimes are published in scientific publications. So, what do we actually mean with the term medication errors when we talk about that? And why are they important to be reported? Medical, medication errors are a major public health problem and the leading cause of death worldwide. Studies have shown that only in the US, there are between seven to 9,000 deaths yearly due to these problems. 
Medication errors or preventable adverse drug reactions have also a big economical consequences on this society. And more studies have seen that costs associated with only medication errors has been, have been estimated as 42 billion US dollars annually. Medication errors is, according to the European Medicines Agency, defined as an unintended failure in the drug treatment process that leads to or has the potential to lead to harm to the patient. It can occur at any stage of the treatment process, including prescribing, storing, dispensing, and administration, and is by far the most common cause of undesired adverse drug reactions in medicine practice. The concepts of intentional overdose, off-label use, misuse, and abuse should be clearly distinguished from medication error since these events do not occur due to an error. Up until today, there are more than 800,000 medication error coded reports. Reports that have been coded with one or more events from the MedRap terminology SNQ narrow. The first report was shared already in 1994. Since the first submission of the medication error reports, different global initiatives have been initiated to stimulate and increase medication error reports. Some of the initiatives involves an expansion of the MEDRA terminology to better capture specific types of medication errors. And stakeholders such as the WHO, US Food and Drug Administration, and the EMA have formed guidelines and expanded existing legislation to include medication errors as a part of the pharmacovigilance scope with the overall goal to improve reporting and capturing of medication errors in spontaneous reporting systems. On this slide, you can see some of the results of, the, of a comparison I made between the number of medication error reports submitted to Vigibase compared with the rest of the database divided into regions. As you can see, most of the reports have been shared by North America followed by Europe. This may be expected since US, for example, was one of the first 10 countries member of the WHO program, which have given them a much longer time to report these reports if we compare to countries that become a member of the program, for example, a year ago. Another reason for the high reporting from the US is that they have been working with these type of medicine-related problems for a long time. One possible explanation in general for the figures on this slide is that in many countries, we still see the fairness to report medication errors. It is still, unfortunately, related with a lot of stigma and blame, which makes it challenging. We need to just accept that medication errors happens everywhere, as with adverse drug reactions. They are there. It's about admitting it and starting reporting in order to have a chance to prevent it from happening. Here I have selected some parameters for both subgroups, medication error reports versus rest of Vigibase. As you can see, when it comes to gender, for example, we do have more or less the same proportion of reports in the female group, while we have a slightly higher proportion of non-medication error reports in the male group. We can also clearly see a statistical significant difference between the amount of information captured on the reports between the two subgroups. Non-medication error reports includes a higher proportion, complete and correct information compared to medication error reports. Now I will present one of the two research projects conducted during the last years in the in 2017, UMC performed a study where we wanted to increase our understandings around the medication errors that have been submitted in Vigibase. The aim were therefore to explore if it was possible to detect medication errors in Vigibase, and if yes, 
how should these case areas or cases be evaluated qualitatively, case by case, or quantitatively, in order to identify signals? So what we did was that we retrieved a drug event list from Vigibase using the high-level group term medication errors and other product use errors and issues. Suspected duplicates and all non-relevant drugs reported on the report, such as when it says antihypertensive drug or vaccines, for example, were excluded. Around 7,000 drug event pairs were filtered out and prioritized according to VigiRank, which I previously mentioned, and the following criteria were applied. We should have at least one of the reports in the case series submitted after 2014. This is because reports concerning errors that had been submitted way before that may have already been covered and controlled. A maximum of 30 reports per combination, basically to make it manageable when we conducted the clinical evaluation. And we should have reports from at least two countries in the case series to have the global spread. We then manually assessed combinations from the drug event list by answering the following questions. Is the risk labeled or well described in the summary of product restrictors, both in the normal product information leaflet, but also in the leaflet that is more directed to patients called patient information leaflet, both in the UK or and in the US? Could this be a risk or error prone drug? Because we wanted to have some kind of hint why we are seeing this arrow together with this drug. We had almost the same reasoning when we looked at the population. Could this be a risk or error prone population? Basically, could this arrow be expected when the drug is being taken by a certain population group? Can you see a pattern in the reported events? And could this case series suggest a new risk of harm? 80 drug event pairs were assessed in total during these almost two days. 10 combinations ended up to be potential signals, meaning that further evaluation was needed before a final decision could be made. In the end, six combinations were confirmed as signals. Signals related to incorrect dosing, incorrect drug administration, and accidental overdose. So these were the six signals identified, all which have been communicated through the WHO pharmaceutical newsletter during 2018 and 19. This study then acted as a basis for our latest project, which was a collaborative project between UMC and the National Pharmacovigilance Center in Morocco. The aim with that project was divided into two parts. One, focusing on method development, meaning that we try to investigate if we can find a way to identify reports that have not been coded as any of the medication error-related terms before its submission. And based on those reports, try to identify signals. The UK summary of product characteristics was, was used as a reference source throughout the whole project. We decided to use the preventability assessment tool, P method, that was developed in 2012 by the WHO with support from the Moroccan National Center and that Rita presented earlier today. The tool consists of 20 questions that should be answered during the case-by-case -case evaluation and a yes to any of them suggests preventability of the adverse drug reaction. We decided to start with the first question, since studies have seen that dosing issues, especially a too high dose, is a common reason for medication errors. To simplify it a bit, we decided to narrow down the pilot data by applying some criteria. Reports that involved an oral administration form given on a daily basis in the adult population were included. Reports related to intentional overdose, completed suicide, and suicide attempt were excluded since those terms are not part of the medication scope. A drug 
AGR combinations list were extracted also here, including a proportion of reports that suggested too high doses. Combinations from this list was then clinically evaluated by answering the following questions. Is the dose reported on the report a true high dose? Is the AGR reported labeled? Is there a possible causal relationship between the suspected and or interacting drug and the reported adverse drug reaction? Do we find any possible explanation for the high dose use? In total, 62 drug ADR combinations were manually reviewed, which corresponds to more than 800 reports. Of these reports, 59% included acceptable doses, according to the UK SBC, and 41% included true high doses. Reasons for false positive cases included mainly coding errors, meaning that the dose information section on the report had been incorrect reported. Of the 41% reports with confirmed high doses, none of the reports did include any reasoning behind why the high dose was given. Information that is crucial when assessing signals in general, especially medication error signals. If the reports would have included an explanation to how the error occurred, there would have been a chance by the national centers to initiate risk minimization actions in order to prevent it from happening again. With this, I will hand over to Dr. Lubna, which will give you a real world experience on how they, on a national level, work with medication error. Thank you, Alain, for presenting the global perspective of medication errors. It is my pleasure to share with you how we deal with medication errors as the National Pharmacovigilance Center. In 2006, the Moroccan Pharmacovigilance Center created a unit dedicated to collecting and managing medication errors. As you know, medication errors are a part of the pharmacovigilance scope and they have great attention worldwide. In Morocco, the process of medication errors management consists of six steps. Collecting medication errors, analyzing them, then constructing a medication error database to identify signals, trigger alerts, and put in place risk minimization action. Over the last 14 years, up to 2,471 medication errors were reported to the Moroccan Pharmacogenes Center. Constructing and analyzing the database allowed to identify 20 signals. Risk minimization actions were implemented to all detected signals. Communication around the risk concerned all these signals. In addition, nine of them led to regulatory actions and in 2018, a fatal outcome with neuromuscular blocking agents led to designing a national health strategy. Now, I will display the process of managing medication errors in Morocco through the signal related to vitamin D2 in infants. In 2012, we had a cluster of nephrotoxinosis in infants with vitamin D2. Eight reports were received, one of which resulted in a fatal outcome. Reports were received from healthcare professionals who directly reported to the Moroccan Pharmacovigilance Center using our ICS form or through the telephone response center of our poison control center, which is a department of the Moroccan Poison Control and Pharmacovigilance Center. Patients' reports were received through the Poison Control Center. The reports were notified as suspected adverse drug reaction. The adverse event of interest was nephrocalcinosis, and co-reported adverse events were dehydration, somnolence, 
vomiting, convulsion, weight loss, tachycardia, hypotonia, hypotrophy, and hyperglycemia. The causality assessment was applied and showed that reported adverse events are labeled with vitamin D. They were classified as adverse drug reactions. Afterwards, the preventability assessment was performed using the preventability method and ADRs were deemed as preventable and considered as medication errors. In fact, the preventability assessment showed that the ADRs reported are dose related and are mainly due to vitamin D overdoses. The vitamin D2 administered to these infants was given as part of the Moroccan program for preventing rickets that was established in 1970. Two doses are recommended, 600,000 international units each. The first two dose at birth and the second one at six months. The SPC of the vitamin D2 used clearly states that this formulation is for adults used only. So to summarize, the dose recommended and administered was a supradose for infants. The medication errors were classified according to the type of medication errors report, uh, reports. Then all medication errors are, med are with adverse drug reactions. They occurred at the prescribing and the administration stage of the medication use process. And the type of errors were regarding were uh, incorrect dose prescribed, incorrect dose administered, and inappropriate schedule of drug administration. Regarding the patient outcome category, we have errors that contributed to or resulted in temporary harm to the patient and required initial or prolonged hospitalization, in permanent patient the harm and inpatient death. The root cause analysis has been performed to identify underlying causes and contributing factors that lead to medication errors occurrence. So we use the Ishikawa, Ishikawa diagram for this purpose. In fact, based on interviews with uh, healthcare professionals, we found a lack of information among uh, these healthcare professionals regarding the signs of vitamin D overdose. We also found that the recommended dose by the Moroccan program for preventing rickets is three times higher than the international guideline. Moreover, we identified a discordance in the recommended doses of vitamin D2 between the patient leaflet and the SPC. In fact, in the patient leaflet, the recommended dose is 200,000 international units for infants, and the vitamin D SPC states that this formulation is strictly for adult use. So only one formulation is available in Morocco, and it is administered for both adults and infants. In some cases, parents administered vitamin D2 at their own initiative. Medication error reports have been entered on VigiFlu. The total number was 31. This signal was detected qualitatively by a manual screening of medication errors related to vitamin D2. The cluster of nephrocalcinosis with vitamin D2 in infants drew our attention and the fatal outcome led to detect the signal. This signal was then confirmed quantitatively using Vigilize. After the first fatal case, two letters have been sent to the Drug Regulatory Authority. We also contacted the Moroccan Program for Preventing Records to discuss the amendment of their recommendations. The risk minimization actions 
were proposed according to the root cause analysis finding and were validated by the Drug Regulatory Authority. Pending the implementation of risk minimization actions, several awareness programs were organized in favor of pediatricians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals to prescribe or administer the third of the, third of the content of vitamin D2 vial. Unfortunately, we received one uh, another fatal case. Then a letter was sent to our Ministry of Health, which accelerated the implementation of risk minimization actions. Risk minimization actions implemented were a dear doctor letter that recommended to draw at attention about signs and symptoms related to vitamin D overdoses, to educate patients uh, encourage about risk related to vitamin D self-medication, and to reduce those prescribed when infants are fed with vitamin D or vitamin D fortified milk. The Moroccan health authorities amended the Moroccan program for preventing rickets recommendations. So the recommended dose is 200,000 international units instead of 600,000. Marked the pediatric formulation of vitamin D2 and added vitamin D2, 200,000 international units in the medicine essential list. As part of communication about the risk, the signal was published in a local journal and displayed in conferences and meetings among, among healthcare professionals, pediatricians, pharmacists, nurses, from both public and private, private sectors. The signal was also used for the education and training on medication errors problematic for healthcare professionals. The risk minimization actions were follow up showed a decreased number of reports. I would like to share with you this signal because the medication error was reported by a patient who noticed reverse posology of the drug indications between the French and the Arabic leaflets. The marketing authorization holder withdrew the drug to amend the leaflet and to harmonize posology in the two languages. This signal points out the importance of considering patients' reports and highlights their role in improving medication safety. My recommendations to national pharmacovigilance centers are to focus on, to focus and deal more actively on medication health management particularly in countries where a patient safety organization is missing. To use good systems to capture and analyze data related to medication errors. This would allow every detection of signals and putting into place risk minimization actions. And finally, lessons learned with, uh, from medication errors should be shared with the pharmacovigilance com community to collectively reach a better patient safety. Now, I will give the floor to my colleague, Alain, for conclusion. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Lubna. So in conclusions from both me and Lubna, medication errors is a part of pharmacovigilance and should be reported encoded as any other adverse drug reaction. It is a part of pharmacovigilance. Try to report as correct and complete information as possible, since that is the key to understand what happened, which can prevent unnecessary patient harm. It is never the individual's fault. It's the systems, processes, guidelines that need to be clarified and so on but never the individuals and last but absolutely not least sharing experiences as dr lubna just said and lessons learned 
with the pharmacovigilance network is fundamental in order to contribute to worldwide medication safety. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alem and Dr. Lubna for this great presentation. Now we have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, what criteria do you take into account when analyzing the events included in BG base and issuing, for example, a health alert? Thank you for that question. There are different aspects when it comes to signal detection, but I think the most important part is, of course, the seriousness of the adverse drug reaction. If the AGR is life-threatening, uh, increasing hospital stay, uh, fatal, of course, uh, those aspects will, of course, be higher prioritized if we compare to non-serious adverse drug reactions. But also, as I said previously, that UMC or the database, Vigibase, contains that more than 20 million reports, which makes it impossible to look at on a you know, case by case basis. So that's why before we conduct our screening process, we need to have some kind of strategy. So we decide a clinical focus area. So this time we will only look at interaction reports, for example, or this time we will only look at vaccine reports and so on. And this is to make it manageable to look at all, to, to look at some kind of data. But of course, I, I would say the adverse drug reactions is the seriousness of that is of course an important part when we conduct signal detection. But I also pass it over to, to Dr. Lubna. In the Moroccan, at a national level, you work by case by case, you have the reports, you have close contact with the reporter. How do you work? Thank you, Alain. In fact, uh, we will we use the same uh, criteria as you say, the seriousness mainly, but also in, uh, our, in, in uh, we focus uh, on recurrent medication errors with high number. So where we have we have these situations, we have uh, we uh, contact the the reporter, the healthcare professional, or the patient, and we uh, uh, we. Uh, try to know how the medication error reports and we do the root cause analysis with them to uh, uh, identify causes and contributing factors that lead to medication error occurrence. Great. That's a very important part, I must say, because at UMC, we don't have the direct contact with the National Center. We can, during our signal detection activities, request for original reports for the, the national center, but then it's up to them if they would like to, if they would like uh, to provide us this data. But we don't have this close contact as you, as a national center, do have with the reporters. So that's a very important part that you just brought up, Dr. Lubna. Okay, thank you. Uh, our second question is: I would like to know how is the current status of other regions so, such as Latin America? to be included within BG base Latin America are submitting reports. Uh, as I showed you on a previous slide, they, when it comes to medication reports, they, as many other regions in BG base haven't really reported, submitted uh, reports in the same context as the US, as I said, for example. But we have, there are reasons for that. US has been in a, in a program for a much longer time than many other Latin America countries. But I must say, Latin America, they are doing great. They are submitting uh, as, as good as they can. Uh, and with more reports from different regions, I think the database would be even a better or richer source to, to use uh, when it comes to detecting new safety signals. Our third question is, many stakeholders sometimes tend to omit reporting medication errors because it can be assumed that it is an admission of guilt for some processes and they don't know want to be uh, pointed out. What initiatives are taken by the Uppsala Monitoring Center to encourage reporting of medication errors? Thank you for that question. Uh, that's a very important part, uh, which I tried to touch upon during the presentation as well. We have the blaming and the yeah blaming issue. It's the fairness. You don't you don't dare to report because you think that 
you will have some consequences of implications on your professional life. So I think that what we try at UMC is we try to identify medication errors and try to publish them and make them make them visible as any other signal. Since, as I said, medication errors is not about an individual's fault. It's about updating, improving processes, guidelines, database. So I think by showing, by publishing medication errors signals, which we have done and which we are planning to do in the future through our work, I think that will also try to that will also encourage other national centers to actually see that oh it is okay to report an error it's not something we're not pinpointing to anyone it's a, it's a mistake something has happened in the process in the drug treatment process that needs to be improved to to prevent further uh, patient harm Okay, thank you so much for your answers. We have a lot of questions, but due to the schedule, the rest of the questions will be addressed at the web page. Thank you so, thank much, you so again. much. And then Dr. Lovna for your interesting presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Thais.